Good afternoon, they're all of our e-guests. My name is Aglia Merkiene and I will moderate today's event on behalf of Baltic Farm and Lithuanian Air Navigation Service Provider Oro Navigacija. It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you here today. I would like to mention that today's event is already fourth event of Interfab's Expert Talk series and we will talk on climate change topic. Just to say that there are more than 150 attendees that have registered in advance shows that the topic is really high, of, or high on agenda and of high importance nowadays. To cover all the aspects of it, we would need several webinars and several discussions, as there are many questions uh, to cover, such as a Green Deal, environmental transparency, environmental sustainability, aviation's impact on climate change and climate change impact on aviation, and so on. So on, we would need several uh, discussions and hours to talk. However, today we have only one hour to present and discuss, so we will uh, concentrate on three main topics. The main top, uh, the first uh, topic is uh, climate impact and mitigation options. The second uh, question uh, to cover is how ETM could contribute to this challenge by identifying climate optimized trajectories. And last but not least, we will talk about innovative uh, MET products and challenges by deploying it. I would like to say that we are more than happy and lucky to have an expert of really deep expertise in this field and profound background, Sigrun Matas. She comes from German Aerospace Center. Um, and have more than 20 years scientific experience in atmospheric modeling using chemistry climate models. Also, she represents European Association ECATS on sustainable aviation and is a participant of several research project in, projects in this field as a coordinator. So, as I mentioned, we are really happy to have her today here. Uh, before she starts, I would like to draw your attention that you are able to post the questions while she is presenting in questions and answers uh, section at the top of your screen. So do not hesitate and uh, question the, make the questions uh, so that we could have an interest, interesting discussion after the presentation. Now uh, we are switching to it and Sigrun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Egle, for this kind introduction, and it's also a pleasure for me to be here today. So, as mentioned, the topic of my talk today is climate change and the role of air traffic management. Um, I'm giving this talk um, for, together with my colleague Volker Greve, who's also with me at the DLI Institute of Atmospheric Physics. Let me briefly outline the, um, the, my talk today. So I will start with an introduction on the assessment of the total climate impact of aviation, of aviation which is comprised of CO2 and non-CO2 effects. Then I will show you on the sensitivity of these non-CO2 effects when you are flying at alternative flight altitudes and can describe you a concept how you can describe the spatially and temporary variation of these effects. I will then also show you results from other research projects where we did case studies in exploring the mitigation potential by climate optimized trajectories. Um, in the second part of my talk, I will also talk towards the implementation of such MET services, which would be required in order to improve the aviation climate impact information and assessment of the overall performance. Um, briefly, I will also talk about the integration of these non-CO2 effects in emission schemes, for example, COSIA. So let's start. Aviation is using fossil fuels and during the combustion, there is a series of products which are released in the exhaust gas. So you have the direct emissions of water and CO2, but you also have combustion byproducts like the nitrogen oxides, SO2, carbon monoxide and soot. And these emissions are released to the atmosphere. Talking about the CO2, in fact, what is shown here is the Mauna Loa curve, how the concentration, the 
ambient concentration of CO2 is increasing with a strong seasonal variation, but it's a strong increase which is um, which shows the anthropogenic contribution to this increase. And in fact, aviation contributes about 2.5% to this increase. But for the aviation, there is more. In terms of climate impact, there is also the non-CO2 effect. And I always say the effect which is the most easy, easily to be understood is those of the contrails, because the contrails, they are visible in the air. Contrails and water vapor are released to the atmosphere. They are kind of anthropogenic clouds, while you also have other effects like the nitrogen oxides, which have a chemical potential to influence the composition and then cause a climate change. Or third, there is aerosols and cloud. And I will come in more detail in showing how the mechanisms work. So what is happening? In fact, you have the emissions. These emissions are released to the atmosphere and they are introducing a change in the atmospheric composition. This atmospheric composition change is changing the radiative balance of the atmosphere and by that is acting as a climate forcing. So if we talk about CO2 and water vapor, in fact, they are called direct greenhouse gases because the gas itself has a radiative impact, which means that the concentration change of CO2 and water vapor is bringing the climate impact. Talking about the NOx unburned hydrocarbons and CO, this is where chemistry comes into play. So the NOx is causing via chemical mechanisms changes of radiatively active gases. And what is here is the ozone, but it's also the methane. So these gases are called indirect gas greenhouse gases, which means NOx do not directly change the radiative balance, but they are influencing other components which are then having a greenhouse gas effect. And I will show you more on this one because the story, this is where it also gets a bit tricky in terms of modeling. Further down, you also have sulfate and particles which are emitted. And this is where, I mean, with the particles and the water vapor, this is where we go um, in terms of the contrails. So you are the water plus additional water from the atmosphere is condensing on ice clouds and this is forming a contrail. So this is the formation. At the same time, sulfate, they also are forming particulate matter in the atmosphere, and this is causing a radiative uh, concentration change in the atmosphere, which is then causing a direct radiative impact. And this is in particular, for example, for the suit. Suit is black, suit is absorbing, so there is an impact there. And beyond this, and this is where you see that, say, the, these, these large number of flashes, there are indirect effects where particles do influence the contrail properties, but also these um, clouds are also impacted by the particles which are around, which means like the size of the cloud materials of the, of the ice particles, they vary with the number of particles. And this is where the clouds and they also have a radiative impact, impact on the atmosphere. So how is the how is the overall picture of those components which finally lead to climate change. In fact, I this figure is kind of show, known because from the IPCC process. So there are assessment studies and there have been updates on these assessment studies in order to give an overall picture on the individual effects. And if we just go, what I, I will just talk you down this figure. So starting with the contrails, the red bar he means it's a warming effect. In total, contrails are warming because they are trapping infrared radiation, which would otherwise go out to space. Same with the CO2, you have a red bar, which is also equivalent to a warming effect. Then you see here the next columns, there are red and blue columns because of you have warming and cooling effect, but the net effect of the nitrogen oxides this is a warming effect and we come to a further other effects which are further here like the water vapor, the direct water vapor, not in a cloud, but direct wa gaseous water vapor, aerosol interaction on the clouds. And then this is something strange for a, for a figure to be empty, but 
while in earlier studies and also individual studies, there were estimates on this very indirect effect, which I was trying to explain earlier. They, in this paper, were, paper which was published last summer, they, and only appeared this year, so that was, they felt like there is no best estimate. The figures are so kind of confusing that there is something, but it's not yet fully understood. So overall, we come to the point to say, okay, we have a non-CO2 effect, and this is the total, we have the CO2 effect. And I think by comparing the two figures, you already see that the, um, the warming from aviation is caused by um, CO2 and non-CO2 effects. But here, what are we talking? What is the physical unit? In fact, it's a forcing, it's a watt per square meter. This is a forcing term. This is not yet what is, what is, what is directly what you're feeling when we talk about climate change. If we, when we talk about climate change, we are talking about a surface temperature change. So this needs to be translated to a temperature chain, change and you want to see how is the future atmosphere reacting. And this is just uh, an, um, illustrating how the individual components contribute to a warming, like for example here the CO2, but also other effects which also contribute to a warming. And if we look at the year 2018 estimates, they say it's about 5% contribution from the aviation to the total climate impact, um, anthropogenic climate impact, while more than 50% are caused by non-CO2 effects. So what is this story with this forcing in forcing term here and what I'm interested here in the temperature change. In fact, this is just to explain you because you will see both type of, of, of numbers indicated. There is a relationship between the imbalance, radiative imbalance that you bring to the atmosphere and the resulting temperature change. And this has been established with a concept which is called the climate sensitivity parameter, which in fact describes how your atmosphere is reacting on a change in the forcing. So this concept has been established while, and this is when it gets a bit more tricky, And but I want to show you because you will see numbers either on this one or the other species, and this is just to show you that they are related. So what you have here is the radiative forcing, and you have the resulting temperature change assuming steady state. Okay, so there is a relationship and you have now expanded this by a kind of efficacy. What's that? What does it mean? Efficacy is meaning that, I mean, the, the lifetime of the perturbation is not infinity. It's not the contrail will be gone. The methane will be gone in 11 years. The contrail will be gone in 6 to 12 hours. Ozone will be gone two months later. That needs to be reflected in your metric. And this is the idea where the concept ERF, which means the effective radiative forcing, and this in fact was the figure I was showing, is combining both in a kind of combined value, which gives you an indication on the strength and the lifetime of this perturbation to the atmosphere, which is driving the climate. Okay, this is in terms of um, highlighting or let's say explaining how the physical units are related one among the others. So overall, there are different metrics. RF, ERF, temperature change, but the presentations are kind of different, but the same message is there. So radiative forcing can be translated to a delta temperature change or an effect of radiative forcing. What is happening if you go to this ERF concept? Contrails are kind of becoming less important, while the NOx ozone becomes more important also due to the lifetime. But overall, just by looking at this figure, what is the main takeaway message? The CO2, the contrail and the NOx are those which are the most promise, prominent. There are others which still have a large uncertainty. So when we talk about no, these non-CO2 climate impacts, I also want to show the, the results of a parametric study where we were just varying the flight altitude of a full fleet. So we were assuming the whole fleet is shifted up, shifted down, and then we wanted to see, okay, what's happening? What's happening with these individual impacts? Can we, is, is, is there an impact? And in fact, this is what is shown here that you see if we fly lower, the CO2, because the assumed inefficiencies is increasing. If we fly higher, the CO2 is decreasing. So there is a slight increase in the CO2, which is shown here. But if we fly lower, we see that the non-CO2 effects, which is water vapor, NOx, contrails, and the aviation-induced um, impact on clouds, on warm clouds, 
they are all decreasing, which means that in this parametric study, we see this strong vertical dependence of the impact and which is leading, and this is where I want to draw your attention, to the possibility for reducing, for mitigating the impact by changing the flight altitude. This, of course, it's a parametric study, but it shows there is something to do about. And then we further explored this in terms of saying, OK, is there a possibility to optimize trajectories to receive the information, what is the performance, and then can we find an alternative trajectory? So in this um, early project, um, ATM4E, which was a CESAR exploratory research, we were exploring the concept of environmental optimized trajectories. We were relying on results of an earlier aeronautics project where the atmosphere in the North Atlantic flight corridor was characterized uh, in terms of how do the impacts vary with location. And I will show you how that is done and I will give you a, an, a, an insight how these patterns are, um, um, are visible and how the, uh, it can be described. So we produced this kind of environmental impact information and studied the feasibility of providing such information for trajectory optimization to say, okay, can we do, can we expand a trajectory optimizer and can we do a multidimensional multi criteria optimization? So how does it then look like? This is a kind of weather chart. This is the weather. This is the, um, the wind speed. This is where you see the jet in the color coding and you see the geopotential, which means like this is where the, where, where, how the atmosphere, how the weather is, kind of. OK, so if we have two locations and then what is the impact of the NOx at these two locations? In fact, what we study is we are releasing NOx at a specific location and this is a, a temporal evolution over, over uh, two months. I mean, um, and then you see how the NOx that is kind of released is, and this is the blue curve, producing ozone. And this is what, what I was uh, mentioning before. Ozone is the radiative active gas. So if the NOx are producing ozone, this is where the forcing lies. So what you see here is about 20, 20 to 30 days after the emission, there is the maximum ozone produced from this emission. And in fact, what is happening here, this is where the chemistry comes in. This is where nonlinear chemistry comes in. And you have a formation process, which is then impacting again, and this is what the green curve here, methane. And methane itself is a greenhouse gas. So if we, if aviation destroys it, there's less warming. So there is a cooling effect associated with it. So that means that this loss means less cooling. Mm -hmm. And you have a series of effects, which means like the warming ozone, the methane effects and so on, which lead to an overall signal in bringing nitrogen oxides to the atmosphere. They are kind of destroyed while the ozone is built up. And in fact, if you compare these two locations, the one, this is in fact, it's not that easy to be seen. This is the US, this is Europe. In fact, this is the North Atlantic flight corridor in a, in a projection. And you see emitting on the left, this is the one, and emitting to the right is this is here. And you see that on there is more efficient ozone production, which shows that ozone is produced more efficiently here, which leads to a higher impact. So a different emission location means different pathways and different chemistry and then also a different effectivity of the emissions. This is kind of linked to these um, synoptic scale weather patterns, which for example, if you bring a perturbation to the tropics, there is more photochemistry, there's more radiation there and there is higher impact, while in the mid latitudes, there's more moderate ozone production. So these are the kind of general relationships. And we studied this with very comprehensive high performance computing simulations, which by the way, take about two months in the machine, which is not something which can be used for air traffic management management to do a forecast for the next day. But nevertheless, this, this was done for eight different, let's say, characteristic weather patterns. And we managed to link these kind of weather patterns with jet locations and so on to find, let's say, how is the North Atlantic flight corridor varying in its impact? And as you see here, dark 
brown means high impact and light means light impact, um, less impact. So if aviation can fly to those regions where impact is lower, this leads to a lower overall climate impact and you can mitigate the overall impacts there. So from this, we were in this project saying, OK, two months simulation time, that's not doable. We have to find a kind of shortcut between the metrology, the meteor data and the climate change functions. So what we did is we were working towards developing algorithms which do this shortcut, which allow us with a weather forecast and an algorithm to produce for the next day, for the next three days, the forecast of the climate change functions. And this concept was explored in order to see, OK, how much could one gain on an individual trajectory? So that was um, within the, the, the project ATM4E, where we said, OK, you have standard MET data, we have air traffic, we have the optimization, and we add this additional information, this additional information which allows us to do environmental assessment, climate impact assessment of a trajectory by calculating with the pre-calculated algorithms, combining it with the standard MET data and providing such spatially and temporally resolved information to the air traffic optimization. And then we can estimate the overall climate impact and search for trajectories which have a lower impact. And in fact, this is what we did for a European case study. We did a one day study and we were exploring how trajectories can be changed and what does it mean for the overall climate impact. I'm showing here two individual trajectories. The one is relating to, um, to the um, Swiss Scandinavia um, Grand Canaria and the other one is a European crossing trajectory. And what is shown here, the left column is the total climate impact for the fuel optimal solution. In the fuel optimal case, you have in blue the CO2, in no red the NOx and a contrail impact, which is caused by this region where the aircraft is flying through. If we avoid that region and we spend some extra fuel, we can reduce the overall climate impact um, considerably. On this trajectory, there was no contrail region, so the NOx impact is kind of driving the optimization and you see by choosing alternative regions where the aircraft is flying in this case that's a slight decrease of the flight altitude you can also reduce the um, the the impact on this trajectory and with for example here half a percent you can um, reduce by nine percent whether for the contrail for this kind of ex more extreme case you can reduce quite considerably so what did we learn we felt we need to better describe with these algorithmic climate change function, the atmosphere, so enhance the technological readiness level, but also, and this is what we did in, in, in the project Fly ATM 4E, what we are currently doing, we have to work on the robustness. Because clearly speaking, if you find an alternative trajectory and if you are working towards a climate optimized trajectory, you have to make sure that you are better performing or at least similar performing than the fuel optimal, even under uncertainty conditions. And there's a lot of sources of uncertainty. So let me show what is the idea in the project that the next step is towards the robustness by using ensemble forecast, by saying, OK, we don't have one weather forecast for the next day, but there are more realizations for the next day. We are exploring how we can help in providing robustness information to the optimizer and this in fact is what the fly atm project objective is so the um, a concept which enables robust and eco-efficient reduction in the air traffic climate impact and as i was mentioning the impacts are strongly driven by the by the weather situations and the 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 the, the um, um, aircraft, uh, let's say, the synoptical patterns. And we are thinking of having, um, let's say, um, those weather situations which are more easily to be forecasted, they have a lower uncertainty. And if we know in advance when there is a weather situation with a good forecast coming up, we can optimize for that day and we will 
deliver more robust solutions. So the idea is to have the cherry picking. I mean, cherry picking or low hanging fruits. This is, let's say, where you can make sure. Where are you sure to make benefits? That's the one strategy. And the other is the win win in terms of where are inefficiencies, where a climate optimization can you can make sure that the climate impact and probably even the costs are reduced. So this is, let's say, the two strategies that we are currently following. The project started um, in mid last year, so we are now at the end of the first year and it's kind of um, delivering initial results in order to also to be working towards recommendation how to further implement, how to further investigate such strategies and how to develop MET products which help the implementation of such climate optimized trajectories. And in fact, when I talk towards the implementation of these climate optimized trajectories, in fact, it relies on the provision of these climate change functions, which means spatially and temporarily varying functions to the air traffic trajectory optimization. optimization. And then the, in this infrastructure, these MET components must be made available. OK, so the idea is you have a weather forecast and then you circulate it via services, swim, electronic flight bag, whatever, which can be then be used for the flight planning but also for the flight execution and the environmental data recording. So this is where you need this kind of um, products to be made available. And we also already explored some kind of ideas how such MET products could be looking like. So there were CESAR projects and we analyzed, um, for example, how to do this. We further need to develop options how to expand the current air traffic management in order to um, to efficient to be able to efficiently plan such alternative trajectories and this is currently also done in a project um, alarm which is building a platform where climate impact is considered as a kind of environmental hazard but also in an aeronautics project where a lot of operational improvements are considered in order to deliver a mitigation potential how much can we save on an individual trajectory so at the right here, there is one additional box which I added in this paper I wrote in 2017. That was this environmental accounting because we are very clear. I mean, nobody would, would or in general, um, a stakeholder would not fly climate optimized if there is no incentive. So if you cannot get an accounting for having flown a better trajectory. OK, so that will be important. And that this is where I want to um, come to, to the last topic where it's the question about the towards the integration of these non CO2 effects in emission schemes. And this is where it's required to develop either market based measures and policy measures how to integrate these non CO2 effects in the current ETS or COSIA systems. This sketch clearly shows the challenge. So the challenge is clear. The more easy the concept you are using, let's say, the lesser you can gain. But the more complex the whole system is, the more complex it is to be um, to be realized. So what am I talking about? I mean, the easiest thing would just be a constant factor. You had the takeover message. Oh, it's a factor of two. OK, so you always have the CO2 multiplied by two. But this would be a wrong incentive because you clearly saw that um, the non CO2 effects depend on the location, so you need such type of information. And this is where a simple factor would give a wrong incentive. However, if we come to the altitude and location dependent, if you and what you see, um, what you saw from the implementation of these climate change functions, the more spatially and temporary resol resolution you want to do, the more complicated it gets. And this is when you then have for these kind of monitoring, reporting and verification activities, which are such an important element in the European emission trading schemes. This is where it gets complicated and it will be key to find a good balance here in order to enable for the stakeholders to be also um, get an accounting of climate optimized trajectories and to make them attractive for the stakeholders to be um, using them. So. This is as a, just an overview on the currently, let's say, 
research projects which are going on. I'm just um, recording the Fly ATM 4E, which is which is running, but also the Alarm project. There is Dunkirk project, which is focusing on the let's say departure and arrival zones. But and this is the um, final point I want to make. Um, there is also a kind of strategic partnership with projects which are working towards improving the scientific understanding on the non-CO2 effects because we feel it's important that we um, reduce the uncertainty in order to enable aviation to perform a risk analysis and to identify such um, climate optimized trajectories. And this brings me to the summary of my talk. So. We have the total climate impact. We saw the spatially and temporarily variation. We saw the novel MET services, and we saw that towards the implementation of such novel MET services, there is still some way to go, but there are concepts which are currently um, under development and which are explored and which might um, pave the way towards an integration of climate optimized trajectories in an expanded air traffic management. Thank you. For, yes. Thank you, Sigrunk, for a very interesting and profound uh, presentation that raised many questions from the audience. And we can move uh, now uh, to the questions and answers series. Uh, so, Alexander uh, Mahler uh, is commenting, uh, synthetic power to liquid fuels uh, based on green hydrogen can be carbon neutral. And he asks, how do the non-CO2 effects of these e-fuels look like? Could you say as bad as with fossil fuels, this be? So, um, so, in fact, if you have sustainable aviation fuels, you can already um, reduce the CO2 contribution. If you have the sustainable fuels, you will not have a CO2 which is accounted for, but they will be sustainable fuels. However, depending on the combustion conditions, there is still non-CO2 effects which occur. However, they are changing, so it requires a kind of um, updated assessment of the effects. For example, um, biofuels in general emit less soot and less aromatics, so there is less particles which are formed, which is causing contrasts which have different optical properties. So this um, aviation, sustainable aviation fuels is one component to add to make aviation more sustainable. Yes. Thank you very much for your answer. And B. Channer is uh, commenting, planning is very important for NTM. So the question is, how robust is this then weather is becoming more unpredictable? Can this method predict spontaneous weather phenomena? Um, so as I was trying to explain, um, in fact, this is a um, weather is a, an important element, and for some of these effects, they are really related to, let's say, some weather phenomena which are changing quickly. So it's important to have a good predictability, and the performance of your prediction is also measured. Every meteorological forecast has a certain performance. So. There will be parts of the impacts which are very difficult to forecast. Let's say we, um, which which will be really this kind of spontaneous. But there is another part which are better and easier to forecast. And the strategy is, if we analyze the days in advance in terms of the synoptical patterns, we will identify those situations which are more easy to predict. Just let me make the example of a summer day. On some, some periods, you have a very stable weather situation and such a stable weather situation is giving you a higher robustness of your climate optimization. Well, on a day when you have, for example, thunderstorms or something which is very, let's say, small scale, even subscale, then it might be more difficult. And for such a day, it might be not the best day to start your climate optimization implementation on a tricky day. But I would recommend to start on a stable day in order to show how you perform. So that's this kind of um, relationship between predictability and robustness of the trajectories. 
Thank you, Sigrun, for a very profound answer. And Roland is asking, uh, actually he's commenting, uh, the discussion on climate change is mainly focusing on CO2. From your presentation, I understood that there are other contributors which may play an important role too, or might be even more important. So the question is, is this correct? And if yes, what is needed to reduce the environmental footprint of aviation substantial? Yeah, in fact, it's completely correct what was what was mentioned here. And I would just let's say show you again um, when I try to, to make this message clear. Aviation has the CO2 and the non CO2 effects, so they both contribute to the overall climate impact, but they both offer a possibility for aviation to reduce its impact. While mentioned the sustainable aviation fuels, they will be playing on the CO2. There are other, for example, the routing strategies and at alternative trajectories, which would focus on the non CO2 effects on the contrail avoidance. Like, for example, I'm trying to avoid nighttime contrails might be beneficial. And there is also a project going on. So this is where the non CO2 effects also offer a mitigation potential which can be exploited when aviation is working towards reduction of its environmental climate impact footprint. Thank you very much for your answer. And Julia is asking, actually she's commenting, I understand that cruising flight level have an important role on the environmental impact. So the question is, if yes, how can this be used? Yeah. As, as I was, was, was um, showing, this cruising level is really important for the vertical dependence of the um, climate impact. And we were showing in this parametric study that even if you shift all the air traffic down, you can reduce the climate impact while, and that was also what I tried to make sure, depending on the weather situation, there is, let's say, it can vary a lot depending on the individual situation and the individual component. It can be also be beneficial to fly a bit higher if a contrail would be forming. So by having this kind of good, um, situ good data, meteorological data available, this kind of situational awareness, if you have comprehensive information on these spatially and temporally varying functions, you can optimize your trajectory accordingly and you can avoid those regions where if aviation emissions have a large impact. And by that you are avoiding the high sensitive regions and you reduce your climate impact. So this is central. It's not only the vertical, but it's also the lateral. So both directions should be exploited for an optimized trajectory. I cannot hear you. Thank you, Sigrun. Uh, Giuseppe Agagnami, uh, if I pronounce correctly his surname, uh, comments, mm -hmm. I understand that such tool will help optimize the trajectory of a fight when local climate change is necessary. So he inquires, uh, how does the tool take into account the space restrictions mm -hmm. along the route due to military activity? In addition to this, do you see positive outcomes for short haul flights then they are rerouted given a different route? Mm -hmm. In fact, um, that, that, that's a good example to, 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 to highlight how, let's say, the airspace is structured. And in fact, a military activity um, is also a region which is blocked. So one could implement also environment also as a region which is blocked for, AV, for, for air traffic management. I think it's easily to imagine that that would make it quite crowded in terms of if you block all the regions, you, leave, you, you only leave a kind of reduced space available. So this is why we think it's important to have, let's say, transparency on where the impact is high and how high it is. And in order to integrate also, let's say, high quality products, which not just simply block a region and say, no, this is closed for climate impact purposes. And then, of course, we all know that such military um, activities, they bring a lot of inefficiency. But let's be creative. Why can't we, if, for example, uh, it's found out with a study that such a military activity, if we push it a bit, let's say, if we reduce it in, in, in the vertical extent or something, this brings a lot of inefficiencies. Probably there will be ways of adjusting also such domains. And I think this is one, let's say, creative 
probably not not such easily to be implemented, but that's a way um, a creative implementation which relies on high quality information on the situational awareness which should be available to the planning. And for the short haul flight, I fully see the point that um, we strongly recommend to make the overall assessment to in, to assess the all the impacts because in fact for a short haul in, um, flight of course you have much less lateral um, um, variation however you have the vertical for a short haul flight there is a strategic decision how high you go and if you sum up all the impacts you know what is the environmental performance and this we think is important to make the sum of all the effects and not leave a part of it out so yeah important question Thank you, Sigrun, uh, for covering this very important aspect of the question. And let's move forward. Uh, Roland is uh, uh, commenting. I understood that we are currently in a project phase. When do you expect will the tools needed will be available in the area control centers? Um, I would. Um, that's that's of course a very important point when we think about the implementation. And this is also where we think one needs to be, let's say, start working. And this is what we did in the early phase by making available in a let's say kind of open way our um, information for for using it for being used in the flight planning system. So we started in uh, in in 2010 with Eurocontrol of and they were using our data and then later we we provided this um, this four dimensional function so that tools can see how they react on this type of information and they can give us feedback what would be the kind of information which would be really be beneficial for implementing such a process and when you um, ask for this kind of area control centers there is current um, currently um, smaller research projects going on linked with the weather services. For example, there's in the European Central European space, there is from MUAC, DLR and D DWD. They are working towards um, having information available when nighttime contrails occur during night and how air traffic could be rerouted. And this is a study which is a three year study, you need a lot of, let's say, statistics if you are working with metrology. So this is a project which just started beginning of this year and they are exploiting this possibility. So how to say it's a prototyping, prototyping type of data which is currently in the control units, but it's already there. They are already gaining experience. They are already saying, OK, I can. This is useful. This is I cannot not use this and so on. So there is already such kind of prototyping um, products, med services, which are currently under development and which are used in the different set of tools. And we are in all our projects always, let's say, make um, available these kind of information like climate change functions. They are made available to everybody who's interested. We are just using a, a, a data protocol and then we know who's using it and it's open to everybody who wants to test it, train it and see if it's useful and we are happy if we provide uh, get feedback. And just to mention the Fly ATM and will also be having stakeholder events in order to get into this direct exchange because as I was trying to make clear, I think the strategic partnership between research and the air traffic management community, you know, all the experts also on both sides should combine and help by this an efficient integration and development. Thank you, Sigrun, uh, for your answer. And as you talk, more and more question arises from the audience. Okay. Uh, we have uh, even uh, more than we expected. So Mark uh, Swan is asking, uh, what about trade off with beneficial wind, uh, such as uh, jet stream over North Atlantic, uh, less time in flight, uh, virus, uh, other weather optimization? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, in fact, this is an important point and we had in an initial study when I mentioned an initial study we, we published in 2013. In fact, we did this analysis for the North Atlantic flight corridor and in fact, we found that depending on the direction of your air traffic, the mitigation potential can be, let's say, quite uh, strongly changing because if you are flying, let's say, with 
with with tailwind and if you're kind of happy of the trajectory you are having and if you have to um, go uh, go out let, let's say um, avoid it and if you have to bit fly north or south you lose a lot on the overall performance which means like if you fly the other direction if you fly against the wind in that um, situation you have a much higher mitigation potential and we have in our let's say research questions we are currently exploring um, we want to understand in which weather situations the non-CO2 sensitive areas are kind of conflicting with the high wind zones and we want to understand this better that to what extent there's always a high impact area blocking the jet or if this is in fact because of the meteorological relationships not the case so this is a research question and we fully see the point because you lose a lot of performance and efficiency if you have to let's say leave the jet um go out to of, of, of the jet so um there is this is currently under um under the investigation by the tools we are developing yes Uh, thank you once again. And uh, talking about uh, research, Thierry Briagou asks, uh, was the optimum flight level taken into account in the, in the study? Flying at a suboptimal flight level could lower non-CO2 climate impact, but increase uh, fuel burned and CO2 emissions. Yeah, in fact, um, the, the, this is a very important question. And of course, the overall performance needs to uh, uh, if you assess your overall performance, you have to make sure that your assumptions are correct and that you are not, let's say, too optimistic, too pessimistic. In our parametric study, we did, I mean, the initial parametric study that I was showing, we did this kind of penalty in terms of saying le flying less um, off the optimum altitude, you lose. OK, or you gain because you have less drag. So these were the, let's say, simplistic um, assumptions in the parametric study. If we are having now in the, let's say, the current projects where we are exploring feasibility, we normally it depends on your trajectory optimizer to what extent it is able to represent, let's say, the vertical dependence of your performance. We have BADA, there's also um, groups which are using the open source data, and this is where you have to be able to let's say do the full accounting for the CO2, but also for the non-CO2 effect. If you are having a different thrust setting, what is the CO2, what is the CO2 emissions, and what is the NOx emissions, which is then triggering the effect. So this is um, this kind of um, the suboptimal flight levels have to be taken into account. And as I was mentioning for the implementation, if you simplify too much by saying, oh, it, I do it, always do it parametric or I just neglect it, then you are making a mistake. So you require a adjusted and necessary complexity of these assessments in order not to give wrong incentives. So that's a very important point and I think it's a very, um, very re relevant question as well. Uh, so thank you once again uh, for the questions and Sigrun for the answers. And uh, Robin uh, is asking about airlines. What do you think is the role of airlines on the environmental optimized trajectories relative to the role of ATM? Mm, I think in my view, it's a combined effort of bringing together. Of course, let's say the roles would be different in terms of saying, if we have an expanded COSIA, it would be the airline who would be doing, uh, who would be interested in the outcomes of the accounting and in the outcomes of the trading. This is the airline when it is, um, when it, uh, which is kind of in the role of receiving the performance data and receiving the invoice. While on the other hand side, it's the air traffic management who somehow has to enable their infrastructure if an airline wants to have a different trajectory. So the airline will say, okay, I want a green trajectory. Can you calculate one? So this is when the air traffic, the, the expanded air traffic management and the infrastructure has to be able to deliver such a trajectory to the, um, the airspace user. So there is a kind of joint effort needed. And of course, and this is also where I say there's also still some conceptual work being done. Also the question like saying, 
what do you get the accounting for? Do you get it on the planned data? Do you get it on the forecast? Do you get it on the real weather data and so on? So there's a lot of, let's say, detailed technical questions, but which according to my understanding is best solved by the combination of the stakeholders, by the combination of the expertise bringing together, but everybody has a different role to play in order to make aviation more sustainable. Thank you, Sigrun. And uh, we have a very broad field of, of questions, starting from technical ones to political. And uh, talking about the uh, political aspect of the question, uh, Bichener asked, do you believe this can help ATM to support the Green Deal? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, we all know that the Green Deal is out and that each sector has to respond to it. In my understanding, I think um, aviation has an interest in identifying those measures, those concepts, which helps most to improve the overall performance. And if it um, improves the overall performance, it will be important to be able to demonstrate it and to show how the performance and how much impact was mitigated. So in my understanding, one component in an um, advanced um, ATM system would rely on having such climate um, climate optimized trajectories available in particular because the integration would rely on current um, current available aircraft engine um, combination so in currently available fleets it's not that all the fleets have to be replaced they they don't have to all change their their, their, their engines they are um, let's say relying on technology which is already installed and this is and of course the infrastructure has to be has to be modified and expanded but i think that it's definitely one step towards a future green um, aviation knowing that a future green aviation with all the let's say mitigation um, objectives might require will require a combination of different me measures sustainable fuels, climate optimized trajectories, alternative propulsion techniques and so on. But I think it's an it's a, a, a really good component to be in, integrated in the greening of the aviation sector. Yes. Thank you for the answer. And as we touched political field, anonymous question is, uh, should the climate optimized trajectories be included by the ANSP's Euro control? Or should we go for a reform of ANS charging schemes, uh, which include external costs such as uh, such that the climate optimal route coincides with uh, the cost optimal route from fuel costs? A and S charge trade off perspective. OK, I, I hope to get the question right. Unfortunately, I was not able to read it, but I think I hope, hope to get it right. Um, I think um, this question refers uh, clearly on the choice of the market based measure, how to best integrate it in terms of put you do you put the labels on it and then you sum up the costs and then you are kind of done if you sum up the cost you just have to make sure that all the labels all the also environmental cost labels which were kind of created in a externalization uh, internalization of external costs process so which means like how much does climate change cost um, if that's kind of completely integrated I am I think, I mean, to my view, currently the air navigation service providers, um, they um, are working towards um, making available greener routes in terms of saying, OK, I don't only I, I, I don't want to be in the future. I will not only provide the wind optimal route, but I also want to see if I can provide a green route for whatever reason. So that would be one step of the implementation. If, of course, all these systems are expanded, if everything is traded, if the full accounting is there, if there has been agreed a mechanism on the certification and on a standardization, then it might be in a far a bit further future might be no need to have the distinction because if all the external costs are internalized then you are done and you go for the cost optimal because it will reflect the environment i'm not fully sure if we will be available 
to fully internalize these external costs. I'm I'm not sure, but I, I cannot see in the future and I think there is a way to go jointly and to, to, to develop this jointly in order to have this balance between complexity, required complexity to not make a mistake and feasibility of the approach of not making things too complicated. Yeah. Thank you for, for your insights. In the, and we have uh, the last question that we are able to cover. Uh, Justas from Vilnius University is asking, uh, are you familiar with some other st uh, studies around the world? If yes, uh, do we provide similar results? Um. Yeah, in fact, um, for the for the other studies, there have been, um, let's say, the individual case studies kind of all around the world. There has been a study for the Asian airspace, um, which was focusing much on the contrails. There has been also for the US, there have been studies. And in principle, they all agree that there is a mitigation potential available. However, sometimes they only focus on mitigating one effect. Like I was mentioning some of them just do the contrails because they are so much visible, so everybody believes in them if you need to believe in some physics, but um, sometimes they they just do one effect also for the reason of simplicity, um, by, while others are working towards the comprehensive analysis. Um, I must admit I'm not aware of so many studies which accept to be using latest research for all non-CO2 effects. We are also not doing all, but all we can somehow find a colleague who is competent in helping us to provide these climate change functions. But all the studies come to the same kind of conclusion. There is a mitigation potential there. It's often by a slight variation of the trajectory that you can already gain a lot. And one is aiming to quantify the benefits, but also probably trade-offs. Thank you, Sigrun, for the answer. And in this place, I would like to announce uh, that uh, many other studies and results of the studies will be presented in September event. Uh, we will hold an event on climate change and air traffic control on September 22-23. So please save the date, September 22-23. Uh, the event uh, will be held uh, here in Vilnius if the pandemic is over. If not, uh, we will have have an online e event. Uh, so uh, we will uh, be more than the happy to see you here. And uh, I would like uh, to thank you, Sigrun, very, very much uh, for a very interesting presentation and profound answers to the question. I would also like uh, to say thank you for the audience that was really active and uh, posted very uh, interesting questions. And uh, see that uh, the event was recorded and uh, will be placed on Fabek website in few days. You will also able uh, to see the answers to the questions uh, written. So uh, visit uh, the website and for now I am saying uh, thank you once again and have a wonderful spring, spring evening. Bye. Thank you very much.